So David, you have an amazing reputation, uh, co-founder of, of Two Sigma. Uh, technology has been such a huge force in how you got to where you are. How much more do you think it can revolutionize our, what, what, what the world looks like? Well, a lot. The, we're really still at, at the earliest days of benefiting from the, dramatic, the Moore's Law uh, effect of bringing the power of computing down to uh, the levels that we've experienced today. The, uh, the, the enabled technologies from you know, uh, very cheap computing include artificial intelligence. The benefits of these advances really are in their infancy. How much... Um, have when you look at where AI was when you first started dabbling in it to where it is now, how much of this did you expect? Uh, none of it. Uh, the The field really uh, is uh, is remarkable remarkable in the following sense that the tech the AI technologies that we have today we don't even really understand why they work so well, and um, in really the advances in the field were de developed. Uh, by experimentation, and the experiments have gone remarkably well. You know, why does deep learning, uh, you know, why can it recognize faces better than you can? Uh, we, you know, scientifically. Also cats. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but scientifically, <laughs> we don't even know why. Why is that? Uh, you and know, how do we answer it? You know, we have to basically, you know, research continues. Uh, you know, the, the work in AI was inspired by the structure of the brain, but the technologies that were built really are, are, are different. Mm -hmm. And so there is something very interesting about the nature of information and knowledge in the world that maps very well. The kind of the patterns in the world tend to have more information that in them than we ever expected. And the deep learning technologies, which power most of AI today, are really good at finding these patterns. But why are patterns so important? That's an open question. Right. Also looking for signals through a bunch of noise, right? I mean, we're just a wash. In, in data to some extent, right? And, and si figuring out what signals matter and which don't. Well, the, and, and you know, so in a way, the confluence of the digitization of the world and machine learning technologies is really what's powering tremendous advances today. You know, a, the AI that we have would not make sense without this incredible digitization of virtually every bit of knowledge, every interaction, every move you take. It's digitized, and then this information coupled with very cheap computing and machine learning algorithms has really changed how we look at everything. And we'll probably continue to. So can we talk about Two Sigma for a second? Uh, amazing quantitative hedge fund, more than 50 billion in assets now. That number's gone up over time. What's the future look like for Two Sigma? Well, you know, our, our vision is really uh, to, to uh, focus on the capabilities of data science. And we think of investing uh, as a data science problem. Uh, we think that um, by incorporating more and more information on the world into making investment decisions, we can do a better job. And uh, you, you know, this is nothing really, in a way, a new idea. Um, uh, investors of all ages have wanted to use data in making their investment decisions. No, no investor would say that they're just you know, waking up in the morning and randomly picking something to invest in. But the ability to basically incorporate Huge, you know, literally, you know, you know, information uh, occurring around the world into every single investment decision that you make. That's only possible by using these advanced data science methods. And I think that you know, even in the field of investing, we're still in the early days of what um, uh, these kinds of methods can do. Can we elaborate on that? Like, where where do you think it can go? Well, um, you, you know, ultimately, I believe that um, AI technology will allow uh, 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 far more human-like uh, uh, comprehension and reasoning than we've achieved today. You know, the, 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 the methods that we use today in investing in other AI fields still resemble looking for patterns in data, which is different than necessarily the kind of common sense reasoning that we all do. Now, eventually, AI technology will move much more in the direction of common sense reasoning, and then th this can em empower uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, uh, new kinds of problems mm -hmm. to be solved, including investing, but not limited to investing. Where else do you think it, are you excited about its potential to solve problems? Well, if you think about self-driving cars, just as an example, and, and this is an interesting one, I, you know, I'm not actually sure how this is going to play out, um, 
The, to some extent, uh, and you know, as we, we're discovering, the problem is harder than maybe people initially thought. Uh, so an open question would be, how much common sense do you really need for a self-driving car to, for example, navigate the streets of New York City? You know, is, is this simply a problem that you know, by looking at you know, essentially uh, patterns in existing data, a car could figure out exactly when to make a turn uh, and to be able to navigate through a crowd of pedestrians. I think that kind of problem will probably be extremely difficult for the current technology because, in fact, that's much more of a common sense reasoning process than uh, extracting patterns in, in, in data. How much time have you sent, spent in a self-driving car? I haven't spent any. I'm seem, not sure I want to. You seem like someone who could do that pretty easily. What, yeah. why, why don't you want to? Well. I, I, you, you know, in controlled situations, I would be perfectly happy to do so. But the, 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 <laughs> the difficulty comes down to you know, not being exactly sure when it works and when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so, it, I mean that, but that's a key yeah. question uh, or a key limitation with AI in that um, it's not like, uh, you know, you can, if you're doing a, a mathematical formula, solving a, an equation, you can prove w whether or not that solution is correct. So you will know. But AI methods, you can't prove exactly when it will work and when it won't work. And so you can see statistically, OK, most of the time this is working very well. But that makes it hard for you to answer the question, well, in what conditions will it not work very well? And you know, for a self-driving car, you know, that is, uh, could be uh, potentially dangerous. You know, sh when should you grab the wheel? Uh, one thing I love talking with you about is New York, because you are a New Yorker through and through. Can AI fix the subways? Well, uh, uh, certainly in countries like Singapore, uh, AI and, and, and uh, big data methods are being used to make uh, decisions about uh, how to utilize infrastructure. I think that um, if you think of the transportation system, say, of New York as a whole, as a big data problem, one that can be optimized, as you know, Singapore, for example, attempts to do, mm -hmm. um, we could find far more cost-effective ways of making improvements to our infrastructure. So I don't, I don't think we need AI to exactly power the trains, per se, but we do need AI and big data uh, 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 approaches to understand how to best utilize and enhance our infrastructure, for sure. Uh, could you run for MTA? Uh, chair, so could you? <laughs> it would be fun. I, as a kid, I had model trains, so I've always wanted something okay. like that. I see two passions com coming together and solving problems for a lot of people. Yeah, I still have the trains. Well, there you go. Uh, so that, that's only part of the problem with New York, for instance. There's also infrastructure, which is something I know that you're also passionate about. So from an investing standpoint, when you look at infrastructure, what needs to change to, to create a better world, frankly? Well, so first of all, I think that you know, Elon Musk had a, an interesting idea with his tunnel boring company. Clearly, there is a need for better technologies to build our future infrastructure. We shouldn't just keep doing the same thing. In the, um, in, in, you know, the, the tech industry, you know, the technology that we have today doesn't resemble at all the technology that we had 30 years ago. <laughs> But in the infrastructure world, we still build bridges the same way. We still build subways the same way. In fact, even the modern signaling system that they're talking about putting into the New York subways at great cost is you know, decades old technology. So there is a complete mismatch between the technology uh, sector's rapid advance and the level of advancement that's occurred in the infrastructure sector. And the infrastructure has also gotten much more expensive while the cost of technology has come down. Do you think about that paradox at all? That, that's, a, 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 and, and that, that's a more general paradox. So m most of the things that we buy have deflated in price. Technology has really dramatically dropped the cost of things like communication, televisions, uh, you know, just about anything that's electronic now is computers. It's all dramatically cheaper. Things that are labor intensive, like building infrastructure and even perhaps more importantly, education, have not deflated in cost. So the cost of getting a college education or building an extension to the subway system in terms of television sets has skyrocketed. And so this is changing the way we think about the relative value of these things, which would, in a sense, discourage you 
from wanting to invest in infrastructure or education and encourage you to buy the cheaper stuff like flat screen TVs, which would then encourage the country generally to go into some kind of overconsumption mode. How do we fix that problem? I don't think there are easy solutions to fixing that because people like the fact, and we all benefit from, the deflation in technology uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, items. Um, and I think that uh, you know, we're, we're, we don't want to, um, for example, have a consumption tax to make it relatively more expensive to uh, consume rather than invest in things like uh, education. Yeah, yet we don't want the cost of education to keep climbing up, 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 up either. We can try to enhance these fields uh, like education with technology and ditto for infrastructure. So I think it's going to be a two-pronged approach to put more effort into better education enhanced with technology, for example, blended learning, um, you know, things like MOOCs, the, the massively uh, uh, online courses. You know, I think it's very promising that you can now go to for free to the Khan Academy and uh, get a good high school education. So things like that, I think, are a way to make education more affordable. But um, uh, you, know, you know, I think we have to do the same to infrastructure. Find out ways to build you know, bridges for half the cost. So if you could talk to President Trump about infrastructure, what would you tell him? I think it's important to have consistency in infrastructure funding. So I, what, what, today we, we know very consistently that we're, we're spending about 18 and a half percent of our GDP on healthcare. That is a very predictable amount. And I think that uh, when it comes to infrastructure expenditures, the number is, is very small. And uh, generally, that number ramps up and down depending upon uh, you, you, you know, the political forces at will. So it's, it's not quite predictable. And it's only a few percent of the GDP. So I think over time, we have to just shift our mindset to be willing to just spend more on infrastructure. Education, by the way, we spend a lot. We just have to find a way to make education e expenditures more effective. So it's a little bit different with education. There, I don't think it's a shortage of spend expenditures. And, and you know, you guys, as a firm, Two Sigma, you, you're awash in people with PhDs and whatnot. Where, where do you feel that the country can invest uh, you mentioned the blended learning. What does that education fix look like on, on a national level, though? Well, uh, the, um, it, it, I, I think one of the greatest parts of American education, in my opinion, is that it's not centrally planned. That um, we, you know, really, in higher education in particular, is, is very innovation driven in the US. It's competitive. You have different universities that are pursuing different strategies for educating people. And I think that this diversity of, of, of let's call them business models in education, has really made America the higher education uh, 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 destination to be around the world. It's really benefited us. So I think in uh, K through 12 education, it's important to have an innovation driven philosophy, not one of central planning. And so the best thing to do is to put in place approaches to allow you know, creative experimentation with different um, strategies for enhancing K through 12 in, uh, education, and then to have mechanisms in place for the best ideas to be pushed out uh, to, to the whole country. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing to do is to make sure that we don't you know, essentially just pick one way to go, because probably we won't get that right. Mm -hmm. uh, so David, we're, we're awash in capital. Those, this world is. Uh, there's a lot of money on the sidelines, not enough investing opportunities. What are we supposed to do about that problem? Well, we should worry because uh, uh, you, you know there really is uh, a remarkable amount of undeployed or underdeployed capital, and in general, uh, the uh, you, you would think that that is going to cause some sort of dislocation. Probably, and we, look, we already see that certain kinds of assets are inflating in price, I think that... Um, Which do you keep an eye on? Well, I, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, in certain markets, real estate prices have certainly inflated. I, I think when you even look at you know, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, people are looking for new ways to store value uh, rather than new ways to invest uh, and, and, uh, and create new things. So I think that there's an, you know, maybe a little bit uh, too much interest in storing value and a little uh, not enough interest in creating new value in expanding the pie. When, when you and Two Sigma talk about crypto as, as a whole, what do, you, what do you guys talk about? Well, the blockchain, I think, is a really fantastic technology. The ability 
to um, have a, uh, a, 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 a distributed system of, of uh, uh, recording ownership. The ability to uh, potentially electronically store uh, contracts and to validate whether or not the contract has been satisfied. So the, the blockchain uh, is really going to have genuine applications. There's an awful lot of hype with the blockchain, but I, I really believe that the blockchain will ultimately uh, create uh, you know, new business models. I think it will be particularly helpful in the developing world where registries are not as established as they are here uh, in the more uh, developed economies. Uh, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, first of all, I, I think it's a misnomer to call them a currency because they're really not particularly designed for transacting. Uh, they're not efficient for that. I think it's really more of a crypto asset. And, um, you know, I don't know. I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that uh, they're going to, you know, hold value the way people expect that they will. Mm -hmm. There's another problem with, with cryptocurrencies uh, when you compare them to a uh, traditional currency, which is that they have uh, a traditional currency, the supply of the money is controlled by a government, the backer, and that's for better or worse. But basically, the, that's important that a government can ratchet up and down the supply of money depending upon demand. I mean, this is a very critical part of how the economy functions. As you know, a cryptocurrency, by design, no one is in charge of the supply. In fact, the mathematics of them limit the supply of cryptocurrencies. So there is no ability, for example, to increase the amount of cryptocurrency circulating to stimulate economic activity. So I think that it would maybe not work so well in our overall economy to switch from our, our current currency system to a crypto-based system that no one has any uh, control of. As a math guy, though, what did you think when you started to see the math behind the crypto space? Well, the, the, I mean, the math behind it is pretty cool. Uh, you, you know, I think from a from a, uh, the, the combination of, of of the blockchain ideas and the cryptocurrency ideas, you, you know, really have opened up a whole new line of thinking about you know essentially um, how encryption can be used beyond just simply trying to protect information. It's a really interesting math problem. Mm -hmm. It's pretty uh, remarkable that this uh, actually was all put together by some person that no one can identify. Do you know, uh, a, a big chunk, by the way, of most uh, uh, Bitcoins are lost. Uh, and you know, Sitting uh, in hard drives and dumps and or, stuff. Or right? maybe gone. And you know, a big chunk of them are you know, essentially were issued to the inventor who uh, has not cashed in even one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is your favorite flavor of crypto when you when you think about it as a landscape? Do you have a favorite one? No, no. Yeah. I mean, I think that they're all about e you know they're about, about equal in my mind. Okay. Um, so you know we're we're <laughs> you know <laughs> how low was that? <laughs> we're uh, years into this epic bull market. Uh, how much concern do you have about the state of the markets in general? Well, I, you, 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 I think that a bull market can't go on forever. Nothing goes up. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I am not uh, an expert at trying. I guess mostly I think it's, always, it's important to be cautious, that, that anyone who believes that something will just go on forever usually is wrong. And uh, so you have to be uh, always prepared for reversals. Uh, I've ne you know, I'm not, you know, the, the approaches that we use for investing are, are you know to um, you know think about the problem from a you know a, you know in a very disciplined way and to assume that you know the downside exists all the time mm -hmm. and so I, I'm not a, I'm, I can't really make any meaningful prediction as to when the bull market will reverse other than boy it's been going on a long time it's it's surprising it hasn't already mm -hmm. and just when you step back and kind of think about your business model as a whole as it relates to downsides and stuff how do you how do you think it would fare if something went sideways or down? Well, we, you know, we, we, you know, we build what we do off of uh, years and years of uh, historical data. We think very hard about uh, uh, trying to um, handle investing in, you know, all kinds of different market conditions. But you know, the past is no predictor of the future. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but. Mm -hmm. You know, all I can say is we try very hard to do our homework. Right. Um, speaking of homework, I know you spend a lot of time thinking about data. 
when you think about data and the, the, where the, what the future holds, what gets you excited about uh, capacity to A, generate alpha, but also just um, unlock potential? I, I think, again, as I said earlier, I think we're really in the earliest of, uh, the, the world has been digitized actually you know, over just a very short amount of time. And uh, we, we still, are, we meaning all of us, are still just trying to uh, determine you know, what are the best ways to use all of this uh, newly digitized information. And so I, I think that this problem will take really uh, decades to solve, uh, if ever. I think it's an extremely hard problem to, uh, to essentially um, uh, uh, you know, analyze and, and, fi f and find uh, you know, interesting, uh, op make interesting observations out of you know, you know, this data. And, and we're, we remain focused on that. By the way, not just for investing purposes. You know, our firm is now applying our know-how to the insurance industry. So I think that there are many, many applications of you know, data science to economic problems. And you know, our firm is very interested in a range of these uh, problems. Which of those um, are you the most excited about, do you think? Like, you mentioned insurance, for instance. Like, wh where, can the, where can you scale? Well, you know, look, the investing world is huge, and we're just a small firm by you know most measures. Uh, the insurance world is equally big, and you know I think those are great opportunities. Yeah. And there are others, but you know those are are exciting to me. We'll watch, ladies and gentlemen. David Siegel, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah.